feeling it. Every day I'm, every day I'm. It's time to spend my three. Yeah. Hey, y'all. All right, I know it's the end of the day. Y'all can do better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. From your chest. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Tanya DePass. Welcome to our panel. It's my last panel of PAX. You have no fucking idea how excited I am right now. <laughs> um, but I am very, very pleased and honored and happy to have a wonderful crew of panelists here with me. Um, in case you did not see the description, didn't read the guidebook or the app, this is what our panel is. And trigger warnings, content warnings. We may and probably will talk about things that have been said to us, about us, etc. If anyone needs to self-care, please feel free to leave. Um, we are not holding against you. Self-care is far more important than hearing us talk. And the panel's being recorded, so you can catch up later. Yay. All right. Um, I have talked a lot this convention, so starting next to me, I'm going to let folks introduce themselves. Our Twitter handles are up there. Again, um, feel free to tweet, um, but please do not video record as we are recording the panel for our own use. Um, and just to confirm, everyone on the panel is fine with photos? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. Khalif, it's you. Just make sure you get my beard. My, little, my beard is looking <laughs> real, real good right now. Uh, Khalif Adams, uh, one third of the Spawn on Me podcast, uh, <laughs> co founder. I'm so, one fourth of the. I'm sorry. I, you're, one fourth of the Spawn on Me podcast. I'm sorry, Tanya. I love you. Uh, also, the greatest gray stone on the planet in Paragon. Just want y'all to know. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and also, super happy that you're all here and super excited for this. It's going to be dope. Uh, I am Brandon Stennis, uh, a.k.a. UGR Gaming. I'm a Twitch partner, also the U.S. Community Manager for XSplit, uh, and overall, like, social media gift master. So, yeah. Uh, I'm Zoe Quinn. I am an independent game developer, and in uh, two days, oh, God, um, I'll technically be an author. Um, and I have run a crisis hotline that helps people that are being attacked by a lot of things you are, um, are probably familiar with if you're at this panel. Uh, I'm Sinead Bryant, uh, senior producer at Take-Two Interactive. Uh, I've been in the industry almost 15 years. <sighs> uh, <laughs> uh, I've worked at, sorry, I'm really close to this mic right now. Worked at Electronic Arts, uh, Midway Games, Capcom for four and a half years or so. I uh, did face computers at Microsoft, and now I'm at Take-Two Interactive. Um, I'm also an author. Uh, I run a tiny blog called TheMushroomQueendom.com that doesn't get updated nearly enough, uh, at least as far as my mentor says. Uh, and then also I just recently started a webcomic called Terrible Allies, which is about <laughs> terrible allies. <laughs> Uh, I'm Caitlin Tremblay. I'm a freelance indie games writer and narrative designer. I am also an author, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, so before we get into our stories, I just wanted to talk briefly about why I decided to have this panel. A lot of people, um, all of us have experienced in some way or another, folks who are like, oh my god, you're, you're famous or you're infamous or you're e-famous, pick your poison. Um, and they want to know all about how we got there, but a lot of people don't want to hear about the actual progression. They just want to see like where you are getting invited to conferences, um, getting invited to be influencers, you know, things like that, being partner streamers, being authors, being devs, but they don't think about the road to get there. So this is going to be that uncomfortable conversation a lot of people actually need to have, because many people want to be, they quote unquote want to be where you are without starting at the ground level. Um, so we're going to talk about our stories a little bit and then get into uh, what does it mean to even have made it, quote unquote. And thanks for, to Caitlin for bringing that up and, and putting the slide in for that. So we're each going to talk briefly about kind of our journey, including failure, if, if folks are comfortable. And going from there, we will talk about more about what it means to have made it and a few intersectional specific things to talk about because the brown folks on the panel have a plus 10 damage modifier in being, <laughs> being out here and about. So, um, Zoe, if you would like to go first. Uh, sure. So, uh, I took kind of a weird path to game development. I didn't really do anything other than sort of uh, come out of uh, Trailer Park Appalachia and work a bunch of weird um, odd jobs until I ended up um, having an internet friend in Toronto that's like, hey, all that sucks. Do you want to try doing the art thing? You can come live with me. And I'm like, hey, yeah, they totally won't end in me uh, dying. <laughs> uh, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to at least try and see if I can do it or not. Um, and 
you know, fail and then I'll not wonder and I can go back to working crappy jobs. Um, somehow this turned into running into the independent game scene in uh, Toronto, which was putting on a diversity initiative, uh, which was entirely grassroots run by other indies. And they were like, yeah, let's teach uh, six women how to make uh, their first games in six weeks. And um, that went kind of okay. I'm still making games, which is cool. And I was immediately like, oh, okay, I like this community thing. This is the thing that I really dig. And I didn't know people could make games like as a person and not as hundreds of people with all of the money. Um, and I had not programmed. Um, so it wasn't until I was like 23, oh, 25, uh, I think, that I actually started coding at all. Um, and I started running a bunch of community events at the same, at the same time because I um, wanted to give back everything that I learned to the next person too because I felt like not only does that get me excited about what I was doing, um, but I felt like uh, I owed it to uh, the community to put back in what, as much as I was getting out. Um, and it taught me so much because it's like new people in scenes bring a lot of cool new perspectives with them. Um, so I did a lot of totally unpaid labor for a very long time. Uh, my first game incubator that I ran for other people, I, and I got myself super sick because I was at the space that I had busted us to get donated to us so we could just like work together um, every day from like 10 a.m. till like 8 p.m. just in case any of the people that were learning for the first time wanted to come in. It was like a bit much. Um, I made a bunch of free games, like trying to make as much tiny stuff, like go any place that would have me, um, that wanted me to volunteer or organize that could help cover travel or anything like that. Just like if you go, if you, if you build me, I will come there. <laughs> um, and just like, there's, there was points where I was only home for like, and home was like a tiny, like very bad closet apartment basically, um, for like a few days a month. Um, and I did that for a very, very long time while having a minimum wage coffee shop job to actually support all of this um, until I got pneumonia and needed some time off and uh, this was after I had gone to Boston. Um, and I basically got fired for needing time off for getting sick. Uh, and then I went home, I filmed a trailer for a game I'd kind of been working on. Um, you can still see in the trailer that my eyes are red because I was like sitting on the curb coughing and crying um, because I had a period of homelessness earlier in my life and I was like so terrified that I was going to be doing that again. Um, so I went home, filmed the trailer for Depression Quest and announced that the release date was Valentine's Day because this happened on February 1st. Um, partially because even when I'm super depressed, I am still kind of a snarky asshole. Um, <laughs> and also to try to be like, you know what, I've been trying this game thing for a while. I've had a hard time interviewing at studios. I've gotten I got asked questions like, what have you done to bring on sexual harassment to yourself in interviews? I've gotten um, almost like taken out of a sexual harassment training video from the 70s, like one of those awkward shoulder rubs that, like from a producer I was interviewing with. So like trying to find a, a well-paying job in games was doing nothing for me despite all of this hustle, which was like years at this point. Um, and I ended up making depression quests as something to see, like I had to put my brain somewhere because I knew myself and my mental health issues enough that if I wasn't super consumed with doing something right then other than just the job hunt and praying and I didn't have like a family to go back to or a safety net that I would, the worst, my worst fears would, would come true. Um, so I expected three people to maybe play it. I, I mostly did it to try to, to, as a life raft without getting too dark about it. Um, and it blew up um, and I got invited to more stuff and I started <laughs> going on the road even more and trying to figure out, okay, how can I actually get paid for my work? Because to this day, like all of my games are free. Like uh, Depression Quest, you can pay what you want. We still donate um, to uh, we uh, to mental health uh, organizations, uh, like a portion of that. Um, and yeah, so I'm still a little bit bad at getting paid. Uh, <laughs> then I ended up becoming a, a lot of people got really mad at me for existing. Um, I don't really feel the need to super go into the details on that. Uh, but if you've heard of Gamergate, I was Ground Zero. Um, I had a, I had the worst OkCupid okay date ever, you guys. <laughs> it's not good. Um, and so now I'm like trying to figure out um, how to make lemons out of the lemon tree that has crashed onto my car and broken my windshield, um, and you know pay that forward. And part of that's like a running the crisis hotline and you know at, like trying to be an advocate for other people and listening to other people being targeted and what can, like, what can I do for you? What can I take out of this that isn't just a, a shitty thing that happened? 
um, and writing about it is that part, and that's where the book is coming in, and I'm really, at this point, just trying to get back to fucking making games already. Um, and that's sort of my journey, and it's ongoing and weird, and I really just want a lot of the bad shit to be a footnote and not the headline. Definitely. Word. Well, I appreciate you, Zoe. I appreciate the hell out of you. Zoe. This will also be a love fest, just FYI. <laughs> That's true. Um, Shanae, would you like to continue? Uh, sure. All right. So, let me talk about how I got into the game industry. Uh, my story is not that interesting. It's very boring, actually. Uh, usually, when, I, when I've been on panels like this in the past, where it's talking about how you get in the game industry, I wind up sitting next to folks who are the same point in their career, and they talk about, oh, you know, I got in the game industry because I did some fan art and then I sent it to a, a magazine and they loved it and they were just like, hey, can you guys come and can you do this art for us every single month and move, like, work their way up and wound up parlaying that into games and that's totally not my story. My story is boring, it is logical, it is, <laughs> I've been playing games since the 80s. Um, I was freaking, like, my, my sister plays games, my twin sister plays games, my dad plays games, we're a family of nerds. I've been playing games since, like, I figured out that these were thumbs. <laughs> um, and uh, I, loved, I loved what that did. I loved being able to spend time, like, having those experiences and spending time with my family and my friends and just doing, like, super nerdy stuff. And uh, around the time when I was 10 or 11 years old, uh, you know, by that time, you probably were about five or six years, you've been having adults were asking you, hey, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, and you'd say something like princess or president, you know, though the standard for being president has come down lately, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> around the time, the time when you're 10 or 11 years old, uh, you really, like, your brain starts forming, you really start, like, thinking about what do I want to, what do I really want to do? And I started thinking about developing games. Because uh, I said, you know what, somebody's making these things, and, you know, this is pre internets so it wasn't kids, right? They're like, there's people whose job it is to make these things, and I wanna be one of those people. So uh, this was back at the time before game design degrees and like where there was a clear path to get into the industry. Uh, so I said, I wanna be, you know, I wanna direct. You know, everyone wants to direct, right? I wanna be a game designer, because that was basically the only job title that anybody knew in the industry. If you make <laughs> games, you're a game designer, right? You code, you do the art, you're a game designer. So I decided I wanted to be a game designer. So I went to college, uh, wanted to learn how to code, had this very logical pathway into game development. Uh, and around my senior year of college, decided I really hate writing code. Like, I, <laughs> that is not for me. Uh, like st Sitting in front of a computer for 18 to 20 hours a day and not playing a game but writing a game was not, not my jam. So I uh, went ahead and got the degree uh, and then got a job at Electronic Arts. Uh, one of the few game companies that exist out in Orlando, Florida. So this is this is where it gets interesting because I started off as a, a QA tester, you know, like the very bottom rung, uh, and it was one of two women that was hired into a department that had 350 men. And this was, it was and it was also a sports game company as well, right? So you hear about locker room environments. This was a locker room environment. Uh, I recall one of my uh, colleagues telling me, or recounting a story to me about a meeting that he had to sit in the day before I started, which he called the don't make me fire you meeting. Um, that was where my future boss brought in all of what would be my future co uh, co-workers and said, hey guys, there's going to be a woman starting here. We haven't had a woman working in this department for at least six months, probably longer. Don't make me fire you. Uh, it didn't really get any more detailed than that, but I'm not sure it needed to get more detailed. Um, that, that particular story told me a lot about, and I'd been working there for a few months before I came across it, but that particular story told me a lot about what sort of environment I was about to be working in. Uh, and I understand that my manager was, thought he was doing the right thing, thought like, oh, I'm trying to create a safe space for her to feel like she can come to work and, and be comfortable. Uh, at the same time, he basically put a big scarlet letter on me saying, hey, that chick right there, the two women that work here, they can get you fired, right? Um, they're different. They're not like you and I. They're here to come and ruin this awesome culture that we've created where we all wear jerseys and that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, but you know, I was, I was probably 22, 23 when I started at Electronic Arts. Uh, I was excited. I was like, oh man, I'm working in the game industry. This is the most amazing thing in the world. Um, and I wanted to fit in, you know? So. Like my colleagues, they all wore jerseys. I started, well, I didn't quite wear jerseys, but at least started wearing t-shirts and wearing 
caps on my head and that kind of stuff. And I was like, you know, I want to be one of the guys. Like that's, you, humans like to try and fit in to spaces, right? And I'm, I'm in a space where I've already been called out as being different. And I'm like, well, I, I don't, I'm not different. I'm just like all of you, right? I like playing games, not sports games, but other games, you know? Um, and that was, a, that was a really interesting experience because um, uh, I, before I even started there, people already had a perception of what interacting with me, like they already had rules of how they could interact with me and the one other woman who, uh, who worked on my team. So the other thing about working in electronic arts, and not to ding electronic arts, it's, I'm sure there's probably some EA people here or something like that, yay EA people. Um, uh, you know, it's in the South, right? And this is some of the stuff, like, I know this is called real talk, by the way, Tanya. I'm not sure how real we want to get. As real as you want to be, just keep realist, in mind we are being recorded. Like we want to get like 100% real. I don't know if we get 100% real. <laughs> oh, no. This might, we might, well, let's see, we might start at like 20% real, and then we okay, might, Shanae, might bump it up in the course you get, of the time. You get two more minutes to get real as you fucking want to be. Oh, my God, two be. more minutes. That's it? You know I could talk forever. That's why I'm um, telling you two minutes. I love you. Okay, well, <laughs> see, that's real she talk. Knows you me. can tell your friends. She knows me. All right, well, then let me skip past a couple of things, right? So, so you know, it's my, one of my experiences in the industry. Like, I'm, I'm a woman. I'm a black person. I am a black woman in the industry. Uh, and... I can tell you like a couple other things just as across my career for the fifth, last 15 years. You know, I gave you a little bit of, uh, uh, I started talking about what my, the beginning of my career was. Uh, but just where I'm in my career even now, uh, basically every interview I've ever been in for every job, someone has brought up my race or my gender uh, unsolicited in every interview. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a weird place to actually be in, right? Because you know, I know a lot of folks that we think to ourselves, well, if someone brought that up in my interview, I would just walk right out. But what if they bring it up in every single interview that you're ever in? You can't use that as a filter anymore, right? Because then you don't get a job. So it, because I like tell, telling stories and because I've got a little bit of time, I'll give you an example. Um, because uh, after I left Capcom, before I started at Microsoft, uh, face computers and HoloLens, that kind of shit, uh, there was a little bit of a gap of a couple of mobile companies that I worked for that I don't tend to talk about very much. They don't exist anymore, so I can talk about them now. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, interviewing for a job with this one mobile company. And uh, we go through the hiring loop. I talk to a few different people, you know, that kind of thing. And it's going really well. And then a gentleman walks in the room, and he's the, uh, the CSO, I believe, the, the chief strategy officer. Uh, he's walking in, he's got his coffee, and this is for a... a a Korean company, a company that was starting a U.S. office here, and their base was in Korea. Uh, he walks in the office, walks in the room, closes the door before he even sets his coffee down. He just says, "So, what do you think about working with all these Asians?" How do you answer that, right? <laughs> and my response is, of course. Asians are people. <laughs> it's just like working with anyone else. I've been in this industry 15 years. I've worked with people of all shapes and sizes, people from all different backgrounds. My job as a producer is to be able to work with people, to figure out how people work the best, um, figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are, figure out how do, we, how do we fit them together, like people who have very different backgrounds and skills and make something awesome. And uh, he's like, okay, you know, cool. Sits his coffee down, sits, sits down in the room, like gets comfortable, doesn't seem like he felt like he asked a weird question or not, but you know, it's kind of weird. Uh, and he continues, we, we have, start to have a little bit of a conversation and then suddenly he pauses and he says, so I want to ask you something, but I don't know how to ask it without getting in trouble. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, okay, well, let me just, let me buckle in for this right here. <laughs> and his, uh, his question is, well, I just wanted to ask, like, like how do you how do you think you're gonna be able to to like you know boss all these guys around? And this question, I know this question well. I've gotten this question for years. What this question actually is is, hey, you're a woman. What do you think about how are you gonna go about bossing all these not women around? How do you do that? It's a bullshit question, right? Um, at that point, the the whole reason, like I'm I'm in the interview, I've you know I've been I've passed all the inter, the um, interim checks. Uh, if I'm in that room, it's because I should be in that room. Uh, it's because I have you know I've been doing this for 15 years. I've been at the time I'd been a producer for somewhere around seven or eight years. Uh, I've worked on big titles, worked on small titles. Um, I'm in this room because I'm supposed to be in this room, and I'm in this room because I know how to work with people and 
and hey, this industry is overwhelmingly male, it is overwhelmingly white, and for, uh, that's, there's no change here. Like, this, the demographic of this particular team is not different from any other team. Um, I think I can handle it. So, when we talk about uh, some of the experiences we have, you know, like I understand as a black woman, I'm somewhat of a unicorn. I know you're giving me time checks. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, sorry. Last thing I will just say, and we'll get back to me is like that as well. Um, some of these stories, like I've, you know, uh, we, uh, these are ex experiences that are shared experiences. And, and, you know, one of the things about being in this industry, it's an amazing industry. Like I've been in it for 15 years. I don't plan on leaving. I just came back to it as well. Um, but we want to make sure that we're, we're being honest and open about the, the challenges that we have in this industry and things that even for those of us who are on this stage and have been doing a lot of amazing things, um, there's like it's, it's a rocky road sometimes to get there. Definitely. Yeah, because yeah, anybody who follows me on Twitter, y'all see what I get on a daily basis. Um, so, Brandon, you, you have a, a short but really amazing yeah, journey because like, yeah. I feel like I've, like I've watched all the stuff you've done. And I'm just like, you never sleep, do you? Yeah, I, I don't have sleep. I don't know what that is anymore. Um, so could you run us through a, a little quickly of your, st of your story, please? Yeah. Um, so basically, um, when I went to college, I wanted to be a teacher. And uh, when I got out of college, I had the mistake of thinking that, oh, when you get to college and get out, you get a job right away. <laughs> and uh, for a while, I was looking for jobs, and I didn't have any you know, experience at the time. So um, I was unemployed for... A, probably like a summer and I was doing, um, just playing video games all the time with my friends. And I always loved writing and I wanted to be a writer. So one day I said to myself, why don't I just, you know, make a, a blog about video games, talk about reviews and stuff. So that's what UGRgaming.com was, 2012. And I started to, you know, post on Twitter, trying to gain an audience and people started to read like my articles. And I started to reach out to companies to try to like get sponsorships. Um, and then I eventually got like taken to PAX East uh, a few years ago. Well, yeah, a long time ago. I've been doing this for five years, but people don't know that sometimes. Um, and we, you know, I had a team of people. We started a podcast that ended up like on iHeartRadio. And then Twitch came about because I wanted to start marketing my website through Twitch. And I realized that you can't market a website through Twitch. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> and I began um, streaming and just being myself, and because I've always been afraid to be myself because of my friends who are now okay with me now. <laughs> um, you know, they didn't get my humor, and I was always like made to feel like me being crazy on the internet or just being myself was just weird. And when I started to just be myself on Twitch, I found like a lot of people coming in to understand me and think I was funny. And I was like, I should keep doing this. I like this a lot. And I was, you know, working at Walgreens for a while, and I was really not trying to talk about like my personal life and it did help me learn about like you know interacting with people and different kind of people all the time like retail definitely does that if you work in retail you know what I mean um, so through the website I got a email from a marketing company called Golan Harris and they said we saw your website and you know we're starting up this new uh, marketing thing for our McDonald's team would you want to work on our social media team and at the time I'm working at Walgreens thinking that this is a spam email so I'm not thinking this is real <laughs> And I go into my first like real professional job and I worked for Golden Harris for McDonald's PR for a year. And then one day I get a knock. Hey Brandon, we gotta talk to you real quick. And I'm like, all right, cool, what's going on? And so my boss sits me down and he says, hey, so McDonald's is gonna let you go. And I said, well, <laughs> what do you mean? Like I've been doing a good job and all that stuff. So basically like, you know, their budget was like, they wanted to lower it. So they tell me that my last day was on my birthday which was like, great. Well, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have bills I have to pay, I live by myself, and I'm streaming on Twitch, I have absolutely no idea what I'm gonna do. So on my birthday, I went to work the final day, depressed, and went home and I streamed on Twitch, and it was like the greatest night of my life because everybody came in, just, they knew what was going on, and it made me feel like this is something I wanna do, and I need to keep doing it. And through that, like, I was unemployed for three months and I strictly streamed on Twitch full time and tried to make it that way but I started to see that it was just something I couldn't do and I wanted to still be a streamer but I wanted to work in the industry. Um, so luckily I found the job um, through the Illinois Lottery doing social media with them and 
I got, let's see what happened. This is funny because Twitter like, is everything to me. I complained on Twitter about something, like I was on a stream team and I was like, I don't know why stream teams don't do much for us. That was the tweet. And so um, I got an email from the, US, no, the UK community manager of XSplit and messaged me saying, hey Brandon, like, are you talking about us? Like, we'll do whatever you want. Like, tell us everything, tell everything that you don't like about it. And I was like, I wasn't talking about you guys, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> I, I love you guys. But I was like, okay, let me do this because like, you know, there are some things that I feel could be different. And so he sent that email to my current boss and they said, you know, the reason why we're not doing anything in the US is because we currently don't have a US community manager. And I said, oh, okay, well, I mean, here's my resume. Could, you wanna, <laughs> why don't you check me out? And so um, I was sitting in the Illinois lottery and they told me that um, they wanted to do an interview. So I went downstairs, like, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. It'll be like 20 minutes. So I'm sitting downstairs like with uh, X Split talking to them. <laughs> and hey. I'm like, all right, so I'm at this job right now. I gotta be really quick, but I love this company. Let's do it. And I sat for two weeks. They didn't say anything to me. And I was like, all right, cool. So. Uh, a few weeks later, I got an email from Twitch saying I had gotten partnered. So I started freaking out because I, I had been streaming on Twitch for two years at this point and like had been grinding and doing all kinds of stuff to try to like put my name out there. And then the next day, I get an email from Xbox saying, hey, you have a job. And I said, wait, you're telling me I got partnered on Twitch and I also got a job with XSplit? I have two things I wanted like this? Okay. So who, who's, like, who's faking this? Like who paid people to do this? Because this can't be real. And um, so that's pretty much how I got to this point. It was just a lot of struggles and you know being like not having a job and having to make ways to do stuff. And um, ever since like these two things have happened, like it has blown up. And I think for my my perspective, I feel like with social media, I'm kind of a jokester. If you guys follow me on Twitter, I, I love gifts. So. I, I think it's for that. And I'm just like kind of a support system for people who are streaming on Twitch who want to learn more or want to get into in the, in the industry because I know when I started, I didn't really have that many people that I could look up to and talk to about it. And I want to be that beacon of hope that like, hey, if you're a streamer on Twitch, you know, there's a more to just being a streamer. Like it opens up the doors for so many things and you want to be open to that. So, yeah. Hey. Okay. Nice. And Brandon is part of why I keep streaming along with our friend Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, no joke. Brandon is one of the few. Brandon is the first person I subscribe to on Twitch with actual money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Paying the bills. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I get to talk about myself. Yay. <laughs> um, so for those who follow me on Twitter, and I will try to be brief because we're already at the halfway point. I do want to have a little time for Q and A. Um, so I was mad about video games at six in the morning, October seventh, twenty fourteen. I was mad about a lot of things, and then I started hashtagging tweets with. I need diverse games. And two things happened. My friend Mickey Kendall, who has a much, much larger, larger Twitter presence than I do, retweeted me. When someone with 30,000 Twitter followers retweets you, one of two things happens. Either you get a lot of randos or you get a lot of exposure. And before I got to work, it was trending. And that's when I learned about Blockbots. And that was not a fun <laughs> couple of weeks. Um, because the hashtag started on my personal Twitter and eventually got its own Twitter account. Um, the conversation happened because unfortunately it was kind of also in the midst of, of the great evil and dark lord rising known as Gamergate. So um, just for the record, I do not give Gamergate credit for where I am today. I will not do it if anyone writes about this panel and says that I will come find you <laughs> because that happened a lot and it still pisses me off. Um, so a community came out of it. People wanted to have this conversation. And then in August of 2016, we became a nonprofit 501c3 because a lot of people, even through the little bit we could do through Patreon, and me going to panels and talking about this, um, sorry, I'm a horse because of all the talking I've done, it, it had an impact. And um, quickly, one thing that really cemented what I'm doing as having an impact was GamerX4. And I go on panels a lot. A lot of times these panels, you know, not all the topics, but a lot of times it's stuff that I know about. I can talk about it in my sleep. It's not a challenge. However, for someone sitting in the audience who has never seen a black person on a panel talk about something beside diversity, it's impactful, it's meaningful. And um, two folks came up to me in GamerX and told me that and talked about how it made them feel like they could do that. They could actually sit on a panel and talk about what's important to them. I burst into tears because I never thought being mad on the fucking internet at six in the morning before work would lead to something like this or getting invited to conferences 
or you know, or making such amazing friends as I have on this panel. Um, so now I do diversity consulting. I talk a lot on panels. I run my mouth a lot when I can't sleep on Twitter. So if you do follow me, expect like random 5 a.m. rants about whatever's <laughs> going on in the world. Um, and I'm also a part of the Spot On Me podcast, even though Khalif forgot about me. I still love you. Um, I canceled the podcast, uh, ended the podcast I did that also came out of I Need Diverse Games after two years and 95 episodes because doing a podcast by yourself sucks. That is a lot of failure on my part, because I hate editing. I'm just going to tell you all now. <laughs> if you ever want me to podcast again, somebody better volunteer to edit. Um, so that, that's what I do, and that's why I wanted to have this panel. Um, so Khalif and Caitlin, your stories are next, and you know I do want to be cognizant of time so we can get through kind of the rest of our topics. So I'll, Khalif, it's all you. I'll be super quick. Um, my first console had wood paneling on it, so that tells you about how old I am. Yeah. I'm older. Whatever. <laughs> um, I love you. Um, so I started a Spawn Point blog uh, in 2011 because uh, I was sitting at my desk at my job uh, doing IT work at a union back in New York, and I felt really stupid hearing someone ask me, how does my mouse, my mouse work? So I was like, I don't want to tell you how your mouse works, and I want to feel smart again, so I need to figure out a way to make my brain work. So I was like, well, let me try to write. Let me see if that will do something. I love video games. I've been playing video games since I was three. Uh, so being able to kind of figure out what that was would be really cool. So we started a blog. I started a blog. And um, started to write. And it was really fun. And I was like, wow, somebody actually listened to, to what I uh, did. And they, they read what I wrote. And then I wrote something long. And then no one read it. And I was like, damn, people don't like when you write long things. And that sucks. But SEO was great if you put bullet points. And that's dope. And then I did bullet point, bullet point articles. And then that sucked. And then nobody read it anymore. So I shut it down. Um, but we did have some success in that, in that space. We uh, had a game called Sound Shapes that was out, if anybody remembers that game. Um, and Sound Shapes, we did some uh, uh, reporting on uh, the DLC that came from the community. So we uh, interviewed some folks. Uh, and got them um, uh, on the site. And then Sony looked out and they were like, hey, we were gonna do something like this, so maybe we can do this together. Uh, so that was like the first success that I had in the gaming industry, was being able to have a big name brand kind of look at what I was doing and say, oh, that's really good, maybe we can do something with that. Um, fast forward, uh, Spawn, Point, Spawn Point Blog turned into Spawn On Me with Tanya and my other two co-hosts, uh, Cicero <laughs> and Sharif, um, brought them all on. Uh, I wanted to figure out what we were going to do in the space that was different. Uh, someone asked me, they said, you know, uh, you do a podcast about gaming, that's cool, but what's the, what's the twist on it? I said, well, no one's doing a show about uh, people of color in the industry. I see things in games that don't really click with me all the time. And how can I express what I'm feeling, uh, but through, you know, maybe a podcast. That would be cool, since no one wants to read the long-form stuff I'm writing. So I might as well figure out how to do that thing. Um, so fast forward again, uh, we've been doing it for four years now. We're uh, heard in over 60 countries. We did uh, almost uh, 189 shows at this point. Uh, and it's been phenomenal being able to kind of bring people to the table who, who hadn't had a voice and who are able to kind of share the reasons why they are in this industry and why they do what they do and how they bring the wonderful games that you all get to play. Um, cool. So I kind of took a really uh, weird way to get into games. I was working full time in book publishing as an editor and um, was also around, uh, I loved games, was playing games constantly, and uh, moved to Toronto and kind of found the indie game scene there. And it kind of became this like uh, reprieve away from book publishing, um, which I don't know if anybody uh, is in the book publishing industry, and I won't slam it too much. Uh, <laughs> was not fun. <laughs> it was exhausting, and it wasn't, I quickly started to realize where I wanted to be, um, mainly because of there's a lot of gatekeeping and there's a lot of, frowning upon indie work and like self-pubbing and any kind of individual expression is really hard to get treated with authority and respect. Um, so while doing this, I started creating my own personal games in Twine and my first uh, game was a very super duper hardcore body horror game where you dismember <laughs> the main character. <laughs> um, but it was a way for me to confront two things, which was A, uh, getting out of a five-year abusive relationship, and also uh, finally starting eating disorder recovery. And so uh, those were things that I just couldn't talk about at the publishing house that I was with, and I just couldn't engage with in that world. Um, and so I made this game and then released it. And somebody was like, hey, that's a really cool body horror game you just made. And I was like, 
that was horror? I was like, that's just how I feel. And they're like, oh, honey. <laughs> so, so I released the game, and then immediately, like two minutes later, uh, the, uh, my abuser called me. We were already broken up this time, and I like hid behind the couch. Like It was my phone. Nobody was at the door, but I still hid from it. Uh, and then it stopped ringing, and then I checked the voicemail. He was like please call me as soon as you get this. I just want to clear something up with you. And I was like, delete. And then uh, never heard from him again. And, but releasing that game was hard. It was rough and it was ugly and it was terrible and it, it brought up a lot of bad things, but it also connected me to a mental health games community that I didn't even know existed. It connected me to so many people who were like, hey, me too, I got this. Let's kind of talk about this or not. Let's just talk about games. Um, and so for the next couple of years, I was still working full time um, and I just kept making these games and these horror games about different iterations of my recovery of different kind of mental illnesses and things and people kept responding and we kind of like bridged around each other kind of like the way blood clots a bit. <laughs> um, and it was amazing and it was powerful and it was something that I felt empty when I wasn't doing and I started realizing like I'm always creating these games like I'm not making any money off them. I'm staying up. I'm working 12 hours to try to make them. Um, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, and it just kind of set me right and it kind of made me realize that I wasn't fulfilled in what I was doing and made me realize that this community worked for me here and there was a reason why uh, people were responding to what I was doing and why I was able to build these connections and actually start healing and, like, and not just like ripping open wounds all of the time, which is what a lot of writing about mental illness can be. Um, Fast forward a bunch of years, still working in book publishing, working 12 hours, uh, doing game stuff, uh, working for studios, like freelance, kind of attending conferences, talking about mental health, kind of getting involved with the mental health community, uh, running game dev workshops for people with different uh, mental illnesses put on by the city of Toronto, which was amazing, and just really feeling fulfilled and awful, and, on, and not awful, awesome. <laughs> uh, being able to kind of like work with people and help people and get them to where I was starting to be like, hey, I don't hate myself every day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then I finally um, got my first studio job about five years out of this. Um, and that, and I was like, yeah, I finally, I got my first video game studio job. It's awesome. I'm full-time writing. This is what I've always wanted to do. It was awful. <laughs> they were super sexist to me and shitty, and it was really terrible and kept changing the conditions of my work. And then finally, it got to the point where my mental health was getting back to where it was when I was in publishing and before I had started making all of my own games. And I was kind of like, you know what? Like, it's not, I can't, I can't do this. I can't be back here, I can't. I worked so hard and games gave me so much empowerment that I, I can't let them now become a tool of like harm again. Um, so I quit. And I say I quit like it was nothing, but like I cried for four days and I was like, I can't afford rent if I quit. <laughs> and then I got a, a freelance games writing contract that would let me afford rent and then they dropped me two months out and then I was like, fuck, <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> um, but because I had spent all that time like investing in my community and building personal friendships and networks that meant something to me. Uh, I was able to kind of segue into full-time freelance and I've never been happier. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm very glad you're here, Caitlin. Thank you. Um, so we've talked quite a bit and in the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of go through a couple of our slides quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, I do wanna have time for questions. So at 7.20, um, people can line up and this is going to be something I reinforce more than usual. If you have a question, then stand up to the mic. If you don't have a question, stay in your seat. Um, I've asked my friends to be on this panel so we can have a very frank discussion and you will respect the panelists. If you cannot do so, your mic will be cut and you will be asked to sit down and or leave. I am a very hard moderator, but in this instance, I'm really not gonna play with anybody in this room, just to be clear. Are we, are we good? a little louder because that was like two people. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to get through some of our slides and just talk through them really quick um, because I do want to at least talk about um, a sense of that, that path that we had to take and the failures that we had because a lot of us don't talk about failure. We're conditioned not to think about it. We think whoever we see at the apex has always been there. They're, they're golden and we don't look at or if we do learn about their failures, 
it kills the shine on, on what they've done, and we think that they are not as good. There's a moral failing. Um, so quickly, Brandon, um, Khalif, and I, and Shanae, we, I'm sure we all heard this, this saying, um, you know, I have to be twice as good to get three times, half as far. It's going to be a good tattoo half one day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my body somewhere. I'm not. I'm like, I succeeded. Fuck y'all. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this is just something to, to be aware of. So anyone in the room who is not a person of color or who may not have heard this growing up, you know, the things that we have, we have accomplished, the things that we have done are, are harder to have come by um, because so many people don't um, get a chance to get where we are, and they hustle just as fucking hard as we do, if not harder. But you know, for whatever reason, either they don't get the access, they don't get their portfolio in front of the right person, or you know, whatever happens, happens, and somebody's got it out for them, and they get taken down before they get a chance to start. So when you are thinking about what you're doing on your path, think about lifting up a person of color who may not have the same opportunities as you. Because there's a lot of mediocre white folks that I know personally that I wonder how they got where they are, and I go, oh yeah, nepotism. They, they were in college with someone. They knew a buddy, and, they, and it bears out that they don't really have the skill to be where they are. Um, this is just a follow-up on that, because when you're visible, and we can transition this um, into talking about failure before we take questions, um, a lot of times when you are visible, or hyper-visible as it may be, when you fail once, it is the end of everything, and no one ever lets you fucking forget it. Uh, one of my friends is a two-time Yugo winner. She is terrified of failing in person or online and saying one thing that can be misconstrued because Twitter's the devil and it's also an angel on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, so just a couple of us, do you want to talk about like kind of either failures you've had or, or things that were made you almost want to quit other than what we've talked about already? I could go with a recent example. Um, so I'm working on my second game and uh, there is I don't even know how many people that are actively combing through every single thing I say and do to try to find something um, to push me to this failure point. So, you know, that's something that's been three years of massive, this hyper visibility that Tanya mentioned. Um, and I'm kind of used to that just being like the background, but to then create in that space where there's already this sort of background looking for reasons to trip you up. Um, looking for something to spin into a conspiracy that will get poss that might look just passably plausible enough to spread because it's like so much so much of my career has been um, dogged by just shit that's not true. Um, it's like I, the the pressure on a sophomore release as an indie already is like so much. I'm switching genres. I'm doing a, an extremely queer game. Um, I'm doing an, exp an experimental game. Uh, and my team, we, we, uh, we have a lot of different, uh, my, my team is very diverse uh, as far as like, I, I, we, we used to joke, joke in meetings that um, my business partner was our token straight white man. Um, <laughs> and then he's someone who lives with disability and he would like roll into the room and make, and, like, make jokes about that uh, at the, at the, uh, across the table to kind of like start it off and when we were kind of like making people feel a little bit uncomfortable with like humor. Um, and with mixed results. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, to not, to try to like release a second game under those terms, it's like, I have pressured myself so hard in crunch to try to make every little thing perfectly, more so than I, like, you have already have like the indie neurosis, the sophomoreitis neurosis, and then the, there are so many people who actively want me to fail neurosis that I um, kind of shut down, especially as someone who has mental health, and I broke and nobody heard from me for three days, and everybody got very worried about me, and I actually compromised my own immune system and got an infection on my, like I have a, like a dermatitis thing that I get like infection that's uh, around my nose and my mouth, and I compromised my immune system so badly that a tooth infection actually started to kind of poison my blood, and I've had massive dental surgery up until the point where I flew to here to, to release a thing. Um, so like the failures are an ongoing thing to try to like work around and the pressure that comes with the hyper visibility because it's not just me failing, it's like, oh, if someone who's a marginalized person fails then it's like, oh, see, this is the reason we can't. Like this is why we can't, you know, like they're, they're inferior, look at this failure point. And like, I feel like it's very easy to internalize that and want to be like 
the model person who's like, no, see, look, I'm like really good at this. Not everything is perfect, and nothing's ever perfect. No game is ever perfect. You just have to ship at some point. Um, and that's like, oh, that's my my most recent failure. Given that it's like last two weeks ago now, I think. Yeah. So yeah, self care failure is pretty massive, and it fucks over everyone on your team and makes you a kind of bad leader, as it turns out sometimes. But you're an awesome person. So are you. Oh. Um, I have not talked about much failure. I know most of us did talk about a personal journey. Um, I lost my job, my day job, in 2015. I came back from GamerX 3, got to work, set up my office because we had moved right before I left, um, was allowed to work half a day, and then I was let go, 10 days before Christmas. Um, I'd already been doing basically two jobs, trying to run I Need to Burst Games. It's a real shitty feeling to come back after you spent you know, a week away, spent a lot of money expecting to come back, you know, get paid, whatever, and suddenly not have a job within a half day of returning. And I almost quit. I almost just said, well, I guess that's it. I can't do anything. Because I started to worry about, again, how am I going to have a roof over my head? Because, you know, no surprise, people working in higher ed don't make a lot of money. I was living check to check. And Patreon was just something I was doing for, for extra money at that point. It wasn't a, okay, I need Patreon in order to survive. But uh, community stepped up, and I'm very honored and thankful that now I can actually pay my bills, more or less, from Patreon and, and keep doing this work. Because if Patreon ever fails, I will be back at a desk job, and what I do will crumble because there's only one of me, and I can't sacrifice myself, my well-being, no matter how much I love the mission. Um, I just want to throw this slide up there before we talk about what being successful means as folks get to line up for, for questions. Um, another thing that comes up a lot is instant success. People think, oh, because I heard of you now that <laughs> you, you came whole cloth out of nowhere, out of thin air, when a lot of times we've been all grinding for years for what we've d been doing. But all they see is like, oh, you've got 20,000 Twitter followers, or you're in this article, or you wrote this article, you made this game. And a lot of people just want to, I can't read that back here, it's a light in my face, Ten thank minutes. you. Um, and so a lot of times, just think about the person that you're seeing has hustled. You know, let's, get, let's kill the idea of instant fame, viral fame. Because trust me, if you are famous for something viral, it's probably not something you ever want in your life. That pedestal is crumbly. You will fall and break your neck. And you know, don't discount the work someone had to do to get where they are. Um, so while we talk briefly about what being successful means, because Caitlin threw the sled, and um, for folks who do have actual questions, you can start lining up and we'll take a couple on each side. I'm not that scary, stand up and ask a question. Um, or if not, hey, if there's no questions then we get to end on time. So Caitlin, do you wanna talk briefly about what being successful even means? Yeah, so I had asked Tanya if you could include this slide because it, um, it's something that I wish I had been told. Um, many years ago, and it's something that I, I give talks at universities and schools, and kids always ask me, um, like, how do you get where you are? Like, um, and like, just asking all these questions, and what I always end up talking about them with is like, what is success? Like, success isn't just being famous, or success isn't just working for a studio that you've always wanted to work for. Like, success can be whatever you want it to be, right? And so I, I really wish somebody had told me this before I went through a lot of heartache, but you can be successful no, no matter what, right? Like you don't have to be popular or famous to be successful. And once I kind of realized that for myself, everything clicked and I just got so much happier. And a lot of the imposter syndrome and a lot of the stress I was putting on myself just kind of like, not all of it, because that's hard shit, um, but a lot of it just kind of became easier to deal with, right? Um, and so I just kind of wanted to put that in there so that think about what you want your success to be and then go for it, right? Like success is what you define it as. Awesome. All right, so we got, we already have our 10 minute warning, so please give us your question. Hey everyone, I'm Alex. Um, I, I'm currently in one of those, those rough places, those rough patches. Um, I was, not to get too real, but I was let go from my job like five days ago. Um, I'm so, so how do you, sorry. No, thank you. I, pre, I really appreciate it. How do you balance, I know Zoe, you were talking about mental health and, and all that, coupled that with like, my partner's behind me blessing, we, we kind of run um, content stuff on the side and we're trying to grow that. How do you manage looking for, you know, like a nine to five, like to, like to keep a roof over my head, mental health, and also like 
not let my partner down? You know, how do you kind of manage this time? It's, it's kind of seems like a lot right now. So if you have any tips. Um, I mean, I, I guess the thing that, because I'm, I'm a little bit in that space where it's like you, you do the nine to five every day and you then try to figure out how you're going to slot all the other things in that you want to do mm -hmm. uh, into the rest of the time that you actually have. Yeah. Um, I focus on small wins all the time. And that's really important because even when my nine to five job is, is not doing what it needs to do to kind of fulfill me, um, I can lean back and look at, and, and if you document the things that are good in the space that you're in, that you have accomplished, that you've kind of knocked down, that you've kind of made a stride towards, um, you have to make sure that you're keeping note of those things. That has been really helpful for mental health for me because I can get really depressed and I'm an introvert and yeah. people don't know that, but it's like, yeah, I'm super introverted. Um, but being able to take note and kind of um, count of the small wins that you possibly can find in the spaces that you're trying to get things done is really, really helpful to kind of move you forward when things are really, really bad. Perfect. Thank and you. have a network of people you can talk to that you can go, I'm having a shitty day, I need to be around people, or I don't need to be around people, yep. or if you don't hear from me like in 24 hours, check on me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have those real friends that you can you know, have those real hard conversations with and make sure they're trusted friends. Um, I found very often if I even try to vent on the internet, I get a lot of useless, unwanted advice and stupid <laughs> advice. Um, it's like, go go try quinoa and yoga. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck and you. So, so have a trusted circle. It's really, really important. Hashtag kale. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm a fi you live in Portland, you don't get an opinion. <laughs> To, to add on to that help. just a little bit, too, uh, you know, I mentioned I've been in the industry 15 years. I've been laid off three times. Uh, the first time I got laid off, it was, I'd been in the industry for 12, I'd been working for 12 years straight. Oh, wow. So it, it came as a shock. It was like, hey, you know, can you come to, come to this meeting room for a second? Okay, your job's gone. All these people you work with, you've been working for the last, with, for the last two years, you're probably never going to see them again. Uh, it's really hard. It's, it's a real emotional thing. And even though we try to separate ourselves from our jobs, like there's still some emotional investment in it, especially for a job you've been in a long time, and especially for jobs in this industry uh, as well, which is a creative industry, so we do tend to put a lot of ourselves into it. So just echoing what everyone said, uh, the first time I got laid off, I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, what do I do? How do I pay my rent? I live in San Francisco. How do I pay my rent? You know, yeah. like, like how do you do things, you know? And... Uh, the very first thing I did was, okay, I know, I know there's some things I gotta get in, in, in check. I gotta get my finances in check. I gotta figure out what I've got and what I don't got and what I need to have. That was really important. Okay. Second thing, like what Tanya was saying, find your, like, find your community. Make sure that they know, like, I've had friends who were laid off and they kept it a secret and you, cause they're embarrassed about it. We shouldn't be embarrassed about it. Like, especially the way the game industry works. There's, there is no shame in losing your job. There's no shame in getting laid off. It happens to people all the effing time. We should talk. We could talk separately about why, it should, like, about why and all that kind of stuff. That's a separate conversation. But also, self care is super important. When you're trying to find a job, it's basically a full time job. When I got laid off from Microsoft back in January, I, I instituted a full time job of finding a new job. But I found myself working till 9 p.m. trying to find a new job. Um, getting up at 6 a.m., like working myself half to death, and I had to take a step back and say, you know what? I still need to take into account self-care because those folks that used to be my, my network, people at work, you, those relationships change. They're at work all day. Um, you're not, yeah. right? So you need to find out what works for you, and you need, that's the most important thing is self-care um, to ensure that you can, um, you can make it. And Thank if you. I could echo that, um, be okay with the fact that you're not going to be perfect at it. Yeah. Like, don't beat yourself up too too hard for it. Since uh, Tanya mentioned talking more about failure, because yeah. uh, I definitely, anytime I was like, ah, oh, you know, I, I, everything's so stressful right now, and I didn't do the right thing, that became like another sort of negative feedback loop. Yeah. And mindfulness is such a good thing to have, and just be like, it's okay to feel shitty about this. I'm going to let the thought yeah. pass and acknowledge that, and let it go and move on. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. All right, so we only have three minutes left, um, and you all have been there a while, and I saw you get up to the mic. So if we don't get to all the questions, which I don't think we will, and we will hang out for a little bit outside the room, because there's another panel that's apparently super popular, yeah. and there's probably <laughs> a huge queue already. Um, so if you could quickly give us your question. Me? Or, are, are you waiting to ask a question? Oh, yeah. 
so this is kind of piggyback, piggybacking off the, uh, the fact that like, uh, for people of color, color, there's that phrase that like, you have to work twice as hard uh, to get even half as far, right? Uh, and for me, like, in 2013, uh, that was kind of when I decided that like, I want to work at a place like IGN or GameSpot or like, one of like, the big uh, uh, gaming outlets because like, I want to be that, uh, well, at the time, I, my, my driving force was I want to be that voice for people who, who aren't heard. Uh, and so fast forwarding to now, now I, I'm running my site with Alex. Uh, we're doing videos, podcasts, articles, working as hard as we can, putting out content that we feel very confident in. Um, oh, okay, and I'm, I'm going to be that moderator. I'm going to mm -hmm. please ask you for the question. Okay. Uh, so when you're in a place when you're, where you're creating content for an industry, uh, to try and get into an industry that feels kind of impossible to get into, how do you like, keep from either quitting or like, going crazy while doing it? Um, I like how everybody just turned to me. <laughs> um, for me, it's like, you know what? I carved this place out. I have bled and I have sweated and I have done all this work. I've hustled for almost three years. The last year and a half, strictly just running on Patreon and people's goodwill. There is a space for me. I see more and more black people where I go. I see more people of color. And I know that eventually, it, it may not seem like right now, but there is a space for us in here. It's why Khalif and, and Sharif Cicero and I do what we do. It's why Sinead stays in the industry. It's why Brandon hustles so fucking hard. There is a place for us, and if I quit, that's just some other mediocre white dude that's gonna come in and take a place that he thinks is his. So that's what I do. I use spite. I actually gave a talk about spite and motivation, um, and Zoe and I were at the same conference. So spite may not work for you, but it works for me, because I'm an ordinary asshole. <laughs> Um, we have one minute left. So we, if you can very quickly ask, and then we will see you outside in the hall. Uh, what's your power up move? Like how, how do you get yourself into your place of power so you can just bust through your barriers? If you have one, or you probably have a whole bunch, but is there just something you do? Bacon. To yourself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I play drums, um, cause nothing makes you feel more powerful than beating on something with a stick. You know? Um, unfortunately, that is time. I know we were very <laughs> chatty. Like I said, we will hang around in the hall for a little bit. Um, and also, please be mindful of people's time and uh, personal space as we go out and answer questions. So thank you all very, very much. Thank, thank you, everybody. For coming. Yeah. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling. Every day I'm hustling.